Thank you for the introduction and also to the organizers for the opportunity to come and speak to you. Um, I hope this works. I can't give a talk without a pointer. I've got a kind of addiction to pointing at things. So that works, lovely. Um, I'm gonna give you a uh, overview of the latest developments in COPD, uh, a bit about the gold guidelines, which are the kind of international guidelines for COPD, a bit about the management of breathlessness. And then at the end, I'll talk a bit about one of my particular passions, which is helping patients to comply with medication, which is a really big issue uh, in COPD. So hopefully the next 30 minutes will be interesting, give you some things that you haven't thought about uh, in terms of the management of COPD. These are some of my disclosures. I do a lot of clinical trials with uh, patients with COPD and bronchiectasis. Um, and so I do have some relationships with pharmaceutical companies. So the things I'm gonna try and cover in the next half an hour would be a little bit about how we evaluate the severity of COPD, because as many of you will know, we've started to move away from the idea that it's all about FEV1 and more towards a more holistic type of evaluation of COPD patients. Talk a bit about how we manage breathlessness. Inhaled corticosteroids are a really big topic in COPD at the moment. Uh, we have new medications on the market containing inhaled steroids. I'll try and give you some pointers to where I think they fit in. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, something about adherence. So this is the most recent update of the international guidelines for COPD. And we know from uh, recent communications draft guidance from NICE that what's happening in the UK will, will, to a large extent, mirror what's in these international guidelines around the assessment of severity of COPD. When we're diagnosing COPD, we look at spirometry. Uh, you know that very well. And the traditional way of assessing severity was based on the amount of airflow limitation. So mild COPD or grade one would be an FV1 above 80% predicted, 250 to 79% and so on to very severe at less than 30%. The most recent update of the international guidelines has moved away from that and said, by all means use spirometry for diagnosis. Uh, and this is helpful just to say how bad somebody's airflow limitation is but it doesn't tell you how severe their COPD is. And so the new way of assessing the severity of COPD is based on this ABCD uh, uh, assessment tool, which takes into account symptoms on the bottom and exacerbation history on the, on the Y axis. And so a patient that has minimal symptoms, so can walk around without much limitation and doesn't have frequent exacerbations would be grade A. Patients with uh, in group B are those symptomatic patients that don't frequently exacerbate. Patients in group C are less symptomatic patients who exacerbate frequently. You find very few patients in this group and if you do see patients in that group, you should suspect other things like asthma or bronchiectasis because patients that have very few symptoms but then have very bad exacerbations probably have something else other than COPD. And then group D are our more difficult patients who have a lot of symptoms, very breathless, and also have frequent exacerbations. And as you'll see on the next slide, the recommendations for treatment for these patients are different. So the, the management of breathlessness, I'm gonna go into a great deal of detail later on, but in terms of pharmacotherapy, the thing that improves breathlessness the most is bronchodilators. And you'll see group A are the patients that have relatively few symptoms and no exacerbations. I'm not going to talk a lot about them. Most of those patients will get an as required salbutamol and that's all that, that's really needed as the initial step. For the patients that have persistent breathlessness, the recommendation is to start with a single bronchodilator. And here it doesn't really matter whether you give a LABA or a LAMA. Uh, and if that's not effective at controlling breathlessness, and we know in about 80% of people, one drug won't be enough, you go to a dual bronchodilator. In the most recent draft of the NICE guidance, there is some discussion of going straight to combination inhalers to keep things simple. In people who've got really bad breathlessness, because I know 80% of those patients won't respond to a single bronchodilator, I often go straight to a labalama. So if a patient's telling you they can't walk 100 yards uh, when they first present, they're not gonna get better with a single bronchodilator. You may as well go for a, a dual bronchodilator. Um, but that's uh, individualized care depending on how severe they are when they present. Then for the patients that are having frequent exacerbations, the recommendation is to start, the green is the preferred option, uh, is to start with a labalama. And then in those patients that continue to exacerbate despite a labalama, you can step them up to triple therapy. And I'll talk later about the fact that we now have triple therapy available in a single inhaler. 
uh, because when these guidance first came out, those drugs were only available as separate uh, inhalers. And then for the more difficult patients, for the first time in these guidance, they've talked about long-term antibiotics as a step on uh, therapy. We use that a lot in secondary care. I think that should stay as a secondary care treatment uh, at the moment because of the risks that are associated with the use of macrolides. Um, and then there's additional add-on therapies there. So that's the overview of where we are with pharmacotherapy for COPD. And it really is about deciding, is this a breathless patient or a patient that's having exacerbations? Because the inhaled steroid options are all only in the exacerbating patients. And in these patients uh, who are breathless, it's about bronchodilation. So let's talk about those breathless patients and what else we can do for them. We increasingly recognize that breathlessness is quite a complex syndrome. We talk about, or we have in the past talked about breathlessness in terms of the FEV1. But if you look at patients with COPD as a whole, you have patients that have FEV1s of 30% predicted, meaning very severe COPD, and they can function really well. Whereas there's some patients I see in my clinic who have an FEV1 of 80% predicted, meaning it's virtually normal, and they're incredibly disabled by breathlessness. So what you need to understand is that the, the size of the lungs or the amount of airflow obstruction is only one component that contributes to breathlessness. And actually the other components are probably the most important ones. This is from a really nice review in the Postgraduate Medical Journal on the, the physiology of breathlessness. Um, it's mostly focused around palliative care, but you can think of, about COPD in terms of a lot of the principles of palliative care. You're trying to manage difficult symptoms in somebody who's got quite an advanced um, disease. And so the breathing and the use of the, the lungs is one aspect of this. The size of your lungs, how hyperinflated your lungs is one aspect of this. The psychological aspects are enormous. A lot of what disables patients with COPD is not the size of their lungs or the severity of the airflow obstruction. It's the, it's the psychological effects that that has on them. It's avoidance of exercise. Um, it's the depression and anxiety that comes with having COPD. And managing that uh, can have as much of an impact uh, as giving a patient a bronchodilator. Uh, there was a, a very nice talk I went to just a few weeks ago uh, from a physician in Newcastle who was using cognitive behavioral therapy to reduce symptoms and anxiety in COPD and getting results that appeared to be far better than we've ever seen with a, with a drug therapy. And then there's the aspect of functioning. It's not just about the amount of oxygen you can bring in, but it's also about the amount of oxygen that you use. The more that your, your muscles waste away, the more that your muscles dysfunction, the more oxygen they have to consume. And so you can have the best lungs in the world. If you need vast amounts of oxygen to, to move dysfunctional muscles, you will feel breathless when you're exercising because you don't have enough oxygen in order to operate your cardiovascular system. And so that's where uh, we tend to underplay it. Oh yeah, everybody should just do exercise. Mm -hmm. Exercise is so important because it maintains the oxygen carrying and the oxygen using capacity of your muscles. Uh, and so the, the holistic management of breathlessness has to incorporate Yes, optimizing lung function, but also thinking about the psychological impact of breathlessness and optimizing functioning. And the thing that does this the best, and you all know this better than I do, is pulmonary rehabilitation, because the, the principles underlying pulmonary rehabilitation are not just exercise, but they're also managing the, the psychological uh, effect of breathlessness, overcoming that fear of exercise, and also doing things like optimizing inhaler technique and optimizing drug therapy so that the patients are less breathless. I think we undersell how good pulmonary rehab is, and that's why I always show this slide uh, from the Cochrane Review, which is kind of the highest level of evidence for, um, for um, evaluating the impact of an intervention. And this is the Cochrane Review for pulmonary rehabilitation in people that have a history of exacerbations of COPD. Uh, and when they looked at this, Pulmonary rehabilitation reduces hospital admissions by 78% and reduces mortality by 72%. There's almost nothing else uh, that consistently impacts on mortality in COPD apart from stopping smoking, uh, but pulmonary rehabilitation does in this context. And patients will walk further and have better quality of life. To put this into terms you can explain to a patient, the number needed to treat to prevent one hospital admission is four. I'm going to mention numbers needed to treat a few times in this talk, so I'll explain what that is. 
That means every four <coughs> patients you send to per rehab, you get one less hospital admission. Simple as that. And for every six people you can get to go to pump rehab, you prevent one COPD-associated death. And that's that. That's the number needed to treat of six. So this is a fantastic intervention. Um, it's been raised at Scottish government level that we don't spend enough on pump rehab in this country. I really feel that very strongly. Uh, and I hope as part of the respiratory strategy that's being developed, uh, investment in pump rehab will be a big part of that because this data is impossible to argue with. This is a really, really effective intervention. So every patient that's breathless, significantly breathless, should be referred to per rehab. Now, what about drug therapy? So we know that people should go to pulmonary rehabilitation. They will do better at pulmonary rehab if they've had appropriate pharmacotherapy first. So we know that bronchodilators are designed to reduce hyperinflation, so they decompress the lungs so you can breathe in and out more easily. That results in an increase in FV1. So this is FV1. Uh, and so you can see here, this is a comparison between spialto and teotropium. Teotropium increases lung function, which is good. Combination uh, of teotropium plus oladaterol increases that almost double. So you get a dub an almost double effect by giving two bronchodilators rather than one. Uh, and that translates into significant improvements in breathlessness. Uh, this is the, the level of improvement in breathlessness using a score called the transitional dyspnea index. It doesn't matter uh, really uh, that you understand what that is. It measures how more or less breathless you are after an intervention. And an increase means that these patients are benefiting from the intervention. Not every patient feels better after two. So you'll see that there is an increase, but it's not huge. And so some people will take a second bronchodilator and not feel any difference should you leave them on the second bronchodilator? Good question. What do you think? <clears throat> so you give somebody two, two drugs instead of one, and they come back and say, since you've given me that extra one, I don't feel any different. What would you do? There is no, there's no right or wrong answer to this. I'm just interested to know what you think. Or the other measurements like it. Yeah. It's a really difficult one. So I don't, and I'll tell you the reason why. Usually when a drug doesn't do anything, I stop it. In the case of bronchodilators, I tend not to. I would always ask the patient, but how much exercise are you actually doing? Because most patients are assessing their exercise. They're doing exactly the same as they were doing before they got the drug. So if their normal walk was down to the shops and back, they're still doing down to the shops and back, and they may not feel different. <laughs> are you trying to do more exercise than you were doing before? The answer is, no, I'm still doing what I was doing before. Try and do more exercise and see whether you do notice a difference. Because a lot of these are sort of static measurements, sim subjective. Do you feel more or less breathless? Well, if you don't do any exercise, you won't feel breathless, and I won't be able to improve it. But this is about also alongside drugs. It's back to that holistic point. Try and encourage patients to do more. Give them the confidence to do more. Tell them that because they're on a second drug, they may be able to do more exercise and they won't get so breathless. Uh, so in the case of bronchodilators, I do tend to leave patients on two uh, if I felt the need to, to push them up to two. I'm going to talk a bit about steroids in this uh, presentation later on, but I want to mention steroids don't have any significant effect on breathlessness. We often get that patient back who's on two drugs and you think, what can I add in now? Because they're still saying they're breathless. Maybe I'll just add in a steroid because it's kind of the next thing. Consistently, all of the studies show that um, steroids have very little effect on FV1. They do have a small effect, but they have very little effect. And they don't make patients feel less breathless. So dual bronchodilators are significantly better than steroids. In this case, I'm showing the, uh, the Ultibro data, but this goes for all of the uh, inhaled dual bronchodilators. Dual bronchodilators are better than steroid-containing uh, ICS LABA at reducing breathlessness, and adding on an ICS does not affect breathlessness. So there's no point in adding on the ICS if your goal is to reduce breathlessness. Send the patient to rehab, encourage them to do more exercise. Drugs are not going to be the answer uh, in that circumstance. So if, that, if I can't give them steroids, what else can I give them? Uh, Back when I was doing clinics in, in COPD <coughs> clinic in Edinburgh, we used to add on theophylline as one of the additional drugs when we're really looking for something to help breathlessness. Some really nice work from Aberdeen 
uh, from David Price and colleagues has just been completed, just been reported, where they compared adding on theophylline against adding on uh, placebo in people who are already on a steroid. No effect on exacerbations or symptoms. So theophylline also doesn't seem to work to reduce breathlessness. So we're back to really exercise, uh, pulmonary rehabilitation. I've put here the, the dreaded scales. That's a picture of me this morning. Um, uh, and this is because a lot of our patients are overweight and will feel less breathless if they lose weight. Looking for comorbidities. A lot of our patients with COPD have sleep disordered breathing. Fix that and they may feel less breathless. Things like cardiac comorbidities can contribute to breathlessness. And then for patients with advanced breathlessness, opiates and benzodiazepines have a very important role, uh, sublingual lorazepam and small doses of, of Oromorph. But none of these things are really drug therapies. They're about uh, optimizing the patient as much as you can, uh, but not necessarily adding in more COPD <coughs> drugs. What about oxygen? So again, there's been some new data around oxygen. We've had oxygen um, since landmark MRC trials in the 1950s showed that people with PAO2s less than 7.3 or less than 8 with evidence of pulmonary hypertension would have a survival benefit with uh, oxygen. So that's patients usually with SATs less than 88% uh, would correspond to these sorts of numbers. Uh, and so we've been asking our uh, colleagues in primary care to refer people for oxygen assessments with SATs less than 92 or less than 90 or less than 88, depending on where you work because those are the patients likely to benefit from oxygen. A lot of our patients say, but I'm really breathless. Would I not feel better with a bit more oxygen, uh, even if my SATs are not as low as that? And so a recent study published in the New England Journal of Medicine addressed this. They gave patients with moderate levels of hypoxemia, so SATs less than 92, but not meeting the criteria on the previous slide that's recommended by NICER oxygen. Um, and these are the, the, the uh, survival curves. There was absolutely no benefit of giving oxygen in this, uh, in this group. No benefit in terms of survival or hospitalizations or improvement in symptoms. So patients didn't feel better being given oxygen if they weren't sufficiently hypoxemic to need it according to our uh, current criteria. So this is great for us because when the patient asks us, would I be better with oxygen, you can say, well, it kind of, it, it makes sense in your mind, doesn't it, that oxygen would help, but people have tested this in hundreds of patients and it makes no difference. In fact, if you really want to seal the deal with that one, uh, the only difference between these two groups was there were more people tripped over in the oxygen group because of the cables in the, in the houses. So people had fractured hips and things as a result of the oxygen, but no benefit in terms of symptoms. So I think this is really useful for us having discussions with our difficult COPD patients who are very breathless to say oxygen isn't the answer, it's what was on the previous slide. Um, I'm gonna skip over this in the interest of time because we need to get to the, the discussion of the inhaled steroid. We now have uh, uh, two compounds, uh, two inhalers that combine the ICS, LABA and LAMA component into a single inhaler. They're called Trimbo and Trelogy. Uh, one's a dry powder, one's an MDI. So we have these now available uh, in order to uh, simplify things for patients. And I think they are useful. I'm gonna show you some of the data so that you can understand where they fit in, the, uh, uh, in terms of their role in COPD. The first one to be published was the, trim, the Trimbo data. So this is their data. The first one comparing triple therapy against the Labalama. So we've, we know Labalama works really well. What's the additional benefit of adding in an inhaled steroid? Uh, this is the study design, big study. 600 patients got the ICS plus the Labalama, Lama. 648 got the, uh, and completed the Labalama arm of the study. And the primary out outcome is reducing exacerbations because you remember I told you at the beginning the purpose of inhaled steroids is to reduce exacerbations. And the outcome of the study is that triple therapy worked. So there's less exacerbations in this group than this group. And it reduced it by about 15%. Uh, and this is for exacerbations requiring antibiotics, and this is for hospital admissions. And there's a small reduction uh, in both of those that don't quite meet statistical significance. But the overall is a 15% reduction in exacerbations with the triple therapy. So triple therapy works to reduce exacerbations in some people. Um, no improvement in quality of life and no, no uh, important changes in lung function. 
So again, I make that point again. If you've got that patient in front of you where the symptoms are the problem, not the exacerbations, they won't feel better if you add the ICS. It's proven in this study and also in the Trelogy study. Uh, but they may have less exacerbations if you add in the ICS. So if they've got a history of a lot of exacerbations, that's where you think about the ICS. That 15% reduction in exacerbations is really important because that's not massive, okay? If you're having three exacerbations in the last year, you'd need to have a one-third or a 33% reduction to have one less on average. So the number needed to treat from this study to reduce one exacerbation was 11. So you'd have to treat a lot of people before you reduce a lot of exacerbations. The other one that was published was IMPACT, which is the, uh, this is the data for Trelogy. Again, really big studies. This is the triple therapy against the two single uh, uh, combination inhalers. And you can see less exacerbations here. And the number was about 20% uh, comparing one with the other. So not significantly different from the Trimbo data. They look as if they work just about the same once you take into account differences uh, in the population studied. Um, and the, but the number needed to treat, because this was a slightly sicker population, was between three and four. So in order to really benefit if you're having a number needed to treat of three or four, you need to be treating people that have at least two, maybe three exacerbations a year to think they're going to have one or two less the next year. So I think it fits very nicely with what most of our formularies say, which is give inhaled steroids to people that are having a lot of exacerbations. Don't give them to people that aren't having a lot of exacerbations. But the other place where these drugs are really going to be useful, and we all know this, is to save us money because people who are on free triple, uh, as in something like serotide plus teotropium, you switch them to one of these combinations, you're going to save a lot of money. Uh, and we're certainly doing that in Tayside at the moment. Uh, but do consider if in the process of switching those patients, do they really need to be on the inhaled steroid or could you change them to something else? Um, we have a choice between these two drugs. Uh, I have particular issues with the, um, uh, the trial that was conducted in this. So this is IMPACT, Trelogy, which is the, uh, the dry powder version. There is a significant increase in the risk of pneumonia. So this is the number of patients with a pneumonia uh, comparing the triple therapy, the other steroid containing arm, and the lavalama. You can see there's clearly more pneumonias in the people that have uh, uh, been treated with the ICS, uh, and the same for pneumonias requiring hospital admission. So there is a, a yin and yang to steroids. They do reduce the frequency of exacerbations. Give them to the wrong people, there is this risk of pneumonia. The good news is the Trimbo trial, they didn't show an increased risk of pneumonia. And that's probably because it's a slightly less potent steroid, uh, but was also testing a slightly less sick population. So we're back to this again. Labalamas for breathless patients. ICS as an add-on to labalama in patients that have a lot of exacerbations. Uh, two, three, uh, whatever you want to use as the cutoff. So I've said that we shouldn't be giving ICS uh, unnecessarily to patients. How are we doing in terms of that? We've recently looked at this using general practice records all across the UK. So this is the CPRD, is the UK database uh, that collects GP data from 2005 to 2015. And the news is we're doing better. So from 2000, in 2005, 77% of uh, new starts on inhaled medications were getting inhaled steroid as their first medication. If you look at those gold guidelines, nobody should get an inhaled steroid as their first medication. And that's come down to, two, to less than half in 2015. So we're prescribing a lot less steroids than we were but we're still prescribing more steroids than we should to people with early disease. So that for that first prescription, it should be a bronchodilator rather than ICS unless the patient's got asthma. This is, this is from a paper we recently published. The paper's called uh, Trends in ICS Prescribing in COPD. I wanted to call the paper Scotland is better than everywhere else <laughs> because we are better than everywhere else. So the darker the color, the more inappropriate ICS prescribing you do. And if you look, it gets worse as you go south, like so many things. Uh, <laughs> and Scotland's doing really well. And I think that's probably because we're quite a small country. We, we managed to have 
good formularies across all of the different health boards and we talk to each other and update our formularies regularly, which isn't necessarily the case in, uh, in the south of England in particular where things are a bit more fragmented. The healthcare generally is a bit more fragmented. So we're doing really well, but we could do better uh, about inappropriate ICS prescribing. The big news in terms of inhaled steroid prescribing is the role of eosinophils. Is anyone using eosinophil counts in their clinical practice to guide ICS prescribing? Anyone heard of this? Wow. So most, I've given this talk a couple of times recently and everyone goes, oh, I'm already doing this. So all of these studies that have looked at ICS prescribing have now reanalyzed their data using blood eosinophil counts, which is a count you get in your full blood count to see whether patients respond better or less well with uh, a raised blood eosinophil count. The reason for that is steroids kill these cells, which are like asthma cells, and about 20% of COPD patients have a raised level of these kinds of asthma cells called eosinophils, and they seem to be the ones that do really well on a steroid. And you can look this up when you go back to your practices in the full blood count that you get from any of your patients. And when they look at these inhaled steroid studies, so the difference between green and blue is how well the steroid is working. The higher your blood eosinophil count, the more you respond. If you've got a low blood eosinophil count, so less than 150 cells or 1.5 on your computer, you don't respond at all. So I've started using this in my practice, and a lot of GPs locally in Tayside are now using this to go, well, if, I, if, I'm, if I've got a question mark, does this person really need this steroid? I'll look at this blood count, and if it's low, I can feel confident that this person is not going to do badly if I stop the steroid. Uh, and again, this is likely to be in the NICE guidance. I've talked a bit about the possibility of stopping steroids. Should we be stopping steroids in some people? Again, it's been tested in research. This is a randomized controlled trial called WISDOM, where they stopped triple therapy in half the patients and carried on in half. Uh, and the overall outcome of the study was no difference between the two groups in terms of exacerbations. So patients didn't exacerbate more if you took away the steroid. But this is a sub-analysis where there was a group that had more exacerbations, and there were patients that had a history of two or more exacerbations in the previous year. So if you're thinking about taking away steroids, who are the ones you should take it away from? Really, oh, that's my thing, there we go. I'll skip over these slides in the interest of time. Really simply, it's people that don't have a history of exacerbations. So if they've got less than two exacerbations consistently, and if you feel like you can use it, use the blood eosinophil count. No exacerbation history, less than 150 cells on the blood count. You can be really confident that person will do well without the steroid because multiple studies have now shown that they will do well. Will be 0.15 times there you go. Nine. Thank you. <laughs> it's different in every place that you go. So right. some reported as 150, some po reported 0. as 0. 0.15. <laughs> so point, so point 0.15, less than 0. 0.15, the patient will do very well. The new update of gold will incorporate the eosinophil counts, and we expect that the, the NICE guidance will also make at least some mention to, to the eosinophil count. So I promised I would finish with my kind of passion for <coughs> adherence. Uh, we talk all the time about inhalers and which inhalers pe people should be on, and we rarely think about whether patients can actually use them and whether they do use them in real life. Uh, so this is my favorite study of the last couple of years, where a group in Ireland uh, attached this kind of MI5 listening device to their patients' uh, inhalers before they took them away from the pharmacy. And this is a really clever device that can hear when you open it, has a little clock inside to get the time of when you open it, and can even tell whether you're taking it correctly because you make a distinctive sound if you breathe in <sighs> properly rather than if you breathe in not properly or if you breathe out, which some people do into their inhalers. Really clever technology. And it lets me ask you that in this study of 265 people with, with COPD on, an, on a dry powder inhaler, what percentage of people took their medication twice a day consistently and we allow 80% or more of the time? 30%. 30%, great. Thank you for playing. Who's next? Twenty <laughs> percent we're, we're going down, yeah. 15%, any advance on 15%? 10? Ten? Ten have a <laughs> pessimist in the audience. 
22% tried to take it, meaning, meaning they, the clock was triggered at the time they were meant to take their drugs, 80% or more of the time. Only 6% tried and succeeded. This is a nightmare. <laughs> This is an absolute nightmare. And this has been replicated in other studies. This isn't just because it was in Ireland. This is a... <laughs> That's the question I get asked. I show this slide and I go, yeah, but that was Ireland. You can't say that. No, <laughs> this has been replicated uh, across multiple countries. This is a, a fact. COPD patients do not take their medications. And when they try, they struggle to take them correctly. Uh, as a result of this, uh, for the last three years, I have sat with a box of inhalers in my office when I do my COPD clinic, and I, it's been a revelation to me, because we used to send them to the nurse to get it done, and that's all fine. Doing it myself, my goodness, what some people do. I've had, I've had people coming in with, you know the Duoclear one, sorry, I'm going slightly off piece, you know the Duoclear one where you press the button and it primes it? I've had people coming in with that, with the button pressed down, like stapled down so that it stays down, sucking on this thing that will not give them a, doesn't matter what they do, it will never give them a drug uh, because people don't know how to use their drugs. They think they've been shown, but they don't know how to use their drugs. This is what your patients are doing right now, okay? So the, the green one here means that they've taken the drug correctly. Yellow means they've tried to take it, but they've taken it wrong. They've breathed into the device, so they've not sucked in hard enough. So I feel really sorry for this patient because this is eight o'clock in the morning, 10 at night. They're trying so hard every day to take their drugs and they're getting it wrong more times than they get it right. But they're obviously really trying to comply um, as opposed to people like this who are just mad. So this, <laughs> so this, this patient is taking, this is, this is like midnight. And this is, you know, one o'clock in the morning. They're just taking it completely randomly and, and wrong every time. This is another pattern of non-compliance, which is this person has been given a twice daily medication and is taking it once a day at 12 o'clock. <laughs> Explain that to me. Uh, and my personal favorite is this person who takes it six or seven times a day for a month <laughs> and, then, and then has a month off because presumably, presumably it builds up in their system. And so, but this is, what your pa this is what your patients are doing right now. So if you, it's all very well me coming and telling you use this inhaler or this inhaler or use a steroid, don't use a steroid. It doesn't matter unless we fix this, which is, and the solution to this is sitting with a box of inhalers and spending time getting your patient to actually use the device correctly. A big part of this is we mismatch patients. So this was with a dry powder. The number one error with a dry powder is people don't breathe in hard enough. Yeah, so the biggest determinant of whether they're gonna be able to do it is really Test them with an inhaler and see whether there's somebody who breathes in slowly or fast. If there's somebody who naturally breathes in slowly, they're gonna be better with a device where you need to breathe in slowly. If there's somebody who naturally, like me, does this when they get given an inhaler, no matter, what, no matter how much you try and train them to use one of these, they're always gonna go back to their natural way of breathing so they would be better with a device that fits their natural way of breathing. And that's why in Tayside we have MDI and dry powder options equal footing uh, in all of our asthma and COPD guidelines because the key thing is to try and match the, the device to the patient and spend time doing that. Um, so we're going a long way with COPD. We've got lots of new medications, but it's still all the same principles of thinking about what's the major problem with our patient? Is it breathlessness or exacerbations or both? Using the right medications, but also remembering that the non-medication related management is probably the most important part of the management of COPD. Non-pharmacotherapy like exercise, uh, managing the psychological comorbidities. Uh, but hopefully there's a few new things in here like the, uh, the oxygen data, the eosinophil data, and the compliance data that will help you in your, your daily practice with COPD patients. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. <laughs>